Tonight's star, Dennis King. The American leaders of 1776, Jefferson, Franklin, Adams, and the rest. To most of us, these hallowed names represent dim, shadowy figures, barely human, usually posed in patriotic attitudes, stiff with the textbook boredom of countless dusty schoolrooms. It is the aim of this new series of dramatic portraits to blow away some of the dust of years, to show you a few of these distinguished men, not only in their greatness but also in their common humanity, as they must have appeared to their friends and neighbors. Tonight we shall meet a Virginian gentleman whose wisdom and courage and human-heartedness are forever embodied in the basic charter of our liberties. We present Dennis King as Thomas Jefferson in Storm at Monticello. Time, the present. Place, a winding state road outside Charlottesville in Virginia. Mr. and Mrs. Jefferson Jones of Main Street, Middle City, USA, are on the way to visit Monticello. They're motoring, of course. Jeff, I do wish you'd drive more slowly. These curves. Yes, dear, but we're late. The garage fellow said the place closes at 7. Oh, we should have left Williamsburg much earlier. And I do believe there's a storm coming up. Yeah, the storm's almost here. Well, this seems to be it. Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation. Ticket office. Admission, 90 cents. There's nobody around. Oh, here comes the rain. I never saw it get dark so quickly. What'll we do? We better see if we can get in the main house up yonder. Come on, Pat, hurry. It's beginning to cut loose. Oh. I'll try the door. No use. She's locked. Oh, you get drenched, Jeff. The rain blows right in. Let's go back to the car. Wait a second. Here's a bell of some sort. Might as well give it a try. Looks like you turn it. Oh, Lordy, that was close. Come in. Do come in. Thank you. Come along, Pat. Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. Are you quite all right? Just a little wet in spots. I guess, being late, we were lucky to find you in, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Burgess, I'm the, uh, the curator here. I often linger a while after the visitors have gone. Of course, it's quite against the rules, but I could hardly turn away a guest in such a storm. Not at Monticello. Now, I, I, I'll be delighted to show you about why the storm wears itself out in these hills. But it's so dark. The uh, electrical fluid has failed, I'm afraid. But I believe I know where the candles are stored. Now, if you'll just wait a moment. I think you'll find the clock over the door rather interesting. Patricia. Patricia, I don't like this. There's something strange about that man. Oh, nonsense, Jeff. He seems to be most obliging. After all, we're intruders here after hours and all. Well, just the same. I... Well, I suppose we may as well enjoy ourselves. Look, I remember reading about this big clock over the door. It's run by those cannonball weights on either side of the room, see? Oh, this you... is rather <laughs> ingenious, don't you think? Oh I... oh, I am sorry I frightened you. Now, if you'll each take a candle... Oh, my, you did scare me, Mr. Burgess. Uh, did Mr. Jefferson build the clock himself? Oh, no, 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 no. He designed it. A Swiss clockmaker built it. It has recently been, uh, what's the word, restored. Oh, well, I'm sure it's very clever, but it's it's sort of overpowering. I don't believe I'd want a cannonball clock in my living room. And what's the ladder for? To tinker with the clock. 
I've sometimes thought that Mrs. Jefferson, well, uh, must have been secretly of your opinion, ma'am. What was Mrs. Jefferson like? She was very beautiful, ma'am, with auburn hair and hazel eyes. Gentle she was, and kind, and most sweetly humorous, having a gaiety of spirit upon which all remarked. Far too good for that stiff and bookish young man she married. Also, I've always thought... He courted her with music, which was his only grace when young, save for the knack of putting down fine words on paper. Oh, did that happen here at Monticello, Mr. Burgess? The courtship? Oh, no, no, no. At her father's plantation called the Forest, down country near the James River. Now, let's see. My how, how time flies. That must have been in the winter of 1771. Now, perhaps you can imagine the scene in... In candlelight, very like this. The tall, rangy, red-haired young man with a fiddle under his chin. Lovely Martha Skelton of the harpsichord. He called her Patty, though, not Martha. And he was very, very much in love. <laughs> believe we played it all the way through without a single mistake. Well, almost. I must confess to one wrong note myself. Why, how perfectly dreadful. Hold out your hand and I shall wrap your knuckles. Give me your bow, sir. Now, your hand, if you please. Well, here you are, Patty. I'm used to this, you know. It is not the first time I've struck a, a, a wrong note in the presence of a young lady. And did pretty Miss Burwell wrap your knuckles, Tom? Oh, no, she straight away married Jack Ambler instead of me, thank heaven. How did you know about Rebecca? Everyone in Williamsburg knew at the time. Everyone in Williamsburg always knows everything. Did she hurt you, Tom? Well, I was very young, and it seemed the world had quite tumbled down about my ears when I lost her. I've heard Mistress Ambler's version. She's very talkative. What really happened? I thought I loved her, Patty. I also thought I wanted to go to England for a year. One night, dancing at the Apollo Room, I tried to get to the point of asking her to wait for me till I came back. It may be she never understood what I was trying to say. Oh, she understood well enough. She pretended not to all evening. She enjoyed your... your... My silly young awkwardness. Your manlike discomfiture. Oh. But, Tom... Yes, Patty. I'd never hurt you. I know you wouldn't, Patty. Not even in play with this bow. Away, cruel bludgeon. No. <laughs> After all, what's one wrong note among so many? Shall we try again? No, not, not just yet. No, if you don't mind, Patty, I'd, I'd like to... <laughs> well, there's something I must say. Yes, I, I was determined not to be misunderstood this time. I, I had written it all out as I liked to do. I even had thought to read it aloud to you, but then, well, that seemed to be a... A wrong note, Tom. Yeah, yes, a wrong note. And so, well, Patty, all the words come down to this. I love you. Will you marry me? Tom. Tom. Even if you had written it out, even if you had read your declaration to me as if I were the house of Burgesses, my answer would still have been yes. You see, I love you, Tom. Oh, there's no thinking about it. I love you. You know, it's strange with me as well. There's, there's no thinking this time. Not this time. It's, it's real. Like, like music. Well, then, it is settled. It has ever been so since first we met. Shall we try Ben Johnson's song again? Surely, my dear. And no wrong notes this time. From now on, Tom, no wrong notes. <laughs> Uh, 
And so they were married on New Year's Day in 1772 with a pair of preachers at five pounds each and a fine deal of fiddle music for a ten-shilling fee. And he brought his bride here to Monticello? Yes, to his beloved mountaintop. But things were quite different here at the time. Uh, this main building existed then only in young Jefferson's soaring imagination. Now, if you'll just come with me through these two glass doors into the cellar, you, you'll notice that when I open the door, thus the other door opens as well, automatically. Well, I declare. Did Jefferson invent that? Too? Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. He was often well in advance of his time. Now, if you'll just look through the windows here... You can see what the guides call his honeymoon cottage. Mr. Jefferson, I'm afraid, would have shuddered at the phrase. Yes, the rain has let, it, let up a little. You can see it. The small square brick structure yonder. Ah, it is small. Yes, isn't it? It seemed even smaller at the time, but rather well snug, I expect. It was very late at night when they arrived in a heavy snowfall. They struggled up the mountain paths on horseback at the end of their journey through two feet of snow, and they found no one about, no servants, and worse, no fire. Must have been a dreary homecoming for the bride. Oh, no, 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 not really. It was young Tom who found a bottle of wine hidden behind a bookshelf, and well, <laughs> they were merry enough, I assure you. Now, if you just come this way, now, this is Mr. Jefferson's bedroom and library. The bed, set in the wall between, could be lifted up on pulleys and concealed behind the upper hangings there. My, Mr. Jefferson must have been almost as fond of gadgets as my husband here. Well, you see, he loved this house. And during all his days, he kept on adding little improvements. He would have asked nothing better of life than be permitted to stay here always. But always and ever. He was forced over and over again to leave his light and airy mountain refuge for the battles of the darkling plain. If you were to seek out at Monticello a symbol of his career, it might well be this, this, this little portable writing box. It's a replica of the one upon which Mr. Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Goodness. On that little thing? Yes, one just like it. You see, it folds up into a very small space. It's no beauty, I'm afraid, but it is neat, plain, and convenient, uh, as he used to say. Somehow, sir, it, it's hard to imagine the Declaration actually being written out. It, it seems as though it must have, well, just happened. Like the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai? Mm. Well, hardly. A great deal of effort on the part of a 33-year-old Virginian went into every word. I can imagine that quite easily. The young man's mother had died only a few weeks before, and he was suffering from a natural depression and from migraine headaches. At the call of duty, however, he journeyed to Philadelphia, there to take rooms in the home of a bricklayer, one Mr. Graff. A parlor and a bedroom with a staircase between the two it was. His violin, like his writing box, went with him everywhere. On an evening in late June, the year being 1776... Beg your pardon, Mr. Tom... Yes, Bob, what is it? A visitor, sir. Looks like that old Dr. Franklin. Well, show him up by all means. Help him up the stairs, Bob. Yes, sir. Coming, Jefferson. Coming. As best I can. Uh, no, boy, I can make it by myself. Oh, this is a great pleasure, Doctor. I take it your gout has improved. Uh, somewhat. If one can discover degrees in absolute misery, at least I'm able to hobble about again. And your migraines. Oh, much better, Doctor. Oh, good, good. Uh, Won't you take a chair? Ah. Ah, that's better. <laughs> a fine pair we make, each bedeviled at an opposite end of the anatomy. Oh, sir. <laughs> uh, well, sir, I can stay but a moment. I'm on my way home from Benfield, out Bristol Way. And I thought I'd see how your work might be progressing. Well, it's almost done, sir. The charges against the king are drawn up as we agree, but I'm... 
I'm having trouble with the philosophical beginning, the, the opening paragraphs. Now, one sentence in particular... Uh, would you read me what you have? The doubtful portion? Uh, certainly, Doctor. Now, let me see this. Yes, uh, this passage here, th- this is giving me trouble. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with inherent and inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and property, etc., etc., as before. And uh, what is your difficulty? Well, the answer? word property doesn't seem quite right, Doctor. The, the meaning is too narrow. But surely the right to hold property without disturbance lies at the heart of our cause. Agreed, and the document as a whole will make that clear. But here in the very beginning, I... You'd like to sing a bit, eh? Yes, sing, perhaps that's it. Besides, the phrase life, liberty and property belongs to John Locke, and it's been echoed by scores of pamphleteers of late. No, I I prefer a a more original expression. Uh, um, Life, liberty... And happiness, perhaps. Yes, I thought of that. But can happiness itself be set down as a God-given natural right? Oh, scarcely. No, not when nature's God afflicts us with gout and migraine. Uh, Jefferson, if you'll pardon an old man's pessimism, perhaps you're struggling in vain for words. Whatever you write, the Congress will surely change it in the end. Still, I have been set the task. I intend to construct as best I can an expression of the American mind in these troubled times. And I'd be the last to discourage such a brave attempt. I merely point out that some three-score minds, most of them belonging to lawyers, not poets, will edit your work in the Congress. Personally, I avoid, whenever I can, drafting papers to be reviewed by a public body. That's a thankless task. Oh, I expect no thanks, Doctor. No praise. Uh, you get precious little of either. Except perhaps from posterity in the event we escape hanging. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I must be going. You'll have the document for our committee on Monday, I presume. I shall, Doctor. Uh, g- g- can I help you, yeah, sir? If you would. Uh, uh, there. <laughs> I'm upright, at least. Surely of all the impediments to the pursuit of felicity, a gouty great toe is the most damnably vile. Allow me, sir. Oh, no, 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 no. I can manage all right now. Good day to you, Mr. Jefferson. And happy phrases to your pen. Good day, doctor. Good day, good day. Hmm. Pursuit of felicity. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of felicity. No, 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 not at all. Pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I have it. At last. Bob, you, Bob. Yes, Mr. Tom. Bob, come here, listen to this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with inherent and inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute Uh, Of course, Mr. Jones, no one today can be quite sure just how or why Mr. Jefferson changed Locke's life, liberty and property to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. What I have told you is at best uh, an informed guess, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, are you there? Right here, sir. I was just looking at the portrait of Mr. Jefferson yonder. Oh, indeed, and you you noticed the curious resemblance to me? Oh, well, many visitors have done so. I, I believe there may be some uh, some distant family connection. Well, well, the storm has renewed its fury, hasn't it? I, I, I think you will find this portrait more interesting than the other, Mr. Jones. Certainly more handsome. This is... Mr. Jefferson's daughter, Martha, or Patsy, as she was called. The painting is by Sally. Oh, how beautiful she was. So lively looking. Yes, like her mother. Very much like her mother. 
After his wife died, Mr. Jefferson could not possibly have gone on save for this, this noble girl. Were there other children, Mr. Burgess? Uh, there were six. Six. Three died in infancy. Only, only two lived into mature years, Martha and Mary. Oh, there was much sorrow at Monticello to balance the great happiness. Do you not feel that this must have been true? I think I know what you mean, sir. I have read that Mr. Jefferson was much, much affected by the death of his wife. For hours after that awful moment, sir, he lay insensible. For days he despaired of living. For weeks he, he remained secluded in his study yonder, pacing, pacing, pacing back and forth in terrible grief. And then one October afternoon, with the autumn sunlight outside challenging the black hopelessness in his heart. Father? Yes, child? May I come in? Why, yes, Patsy, do come in, of course. Auntie Carr said I was to ask, are you not feeling better, Father? Why, yes, yes, I am. I believe I am. And, and I was to tell you, Dabney said the measles, but he's better now, too. And, and Janie didn't catch it from him. And, and Grizzle has a new coat. A filly, Father. And, and Jupiter says Caractacus needs exercise very badly. And, and all the stable boys are sad. And, and when are you going to come riding with me again? I suppose you've been riding every day? Yes, Father. On Berger. I'm not studying at all. N no, Father. But the woods is so pretty now. And I've not heard you practicing the forte piano. Not once. But, but Auntie Carr said I was not to. Not after Mother... After Mother went away. No, there, there, child, forgive me. My, my thoughts, I'm afraid, have been too firmly fastened upon myself alone. But we must see that your studies are resumed. Now, before your mother... That is, some time ago I drew up a daily schedule I'd like to have you follow. It's in my desk. Yes, yes, here it is. Now, from eight to ten, practice music. From ten to one, dance one day and draw another. From one to two, draw on the day you dance and write a letter next day. From three to four, read French. From four to five, exercise yourself in music. From five till bedtime, read in English, write, etc., etc., well, my dear, what do you think of our little list? My goodness, Father. You've left no room at all for the horses. So I haven't. So I haven't. Well, my dear, we shall certainly need to draw up an amendment. <laughs> well, the chair consents, and it is so ordered. The horses go in at a gallop. <laughs> no, Patsy. <laughs> Father... Yes, Patsy? You... Well, you were laughing again. So I was. You've helped me, child. You've helped me very much indeed. Everyone has... has been so worried. Yes, I guess I've been making myself a problem to the entire household. No, no more of that. Patsy, I... I want you to run. Run, mind you. I want you to run and tell Jupiter to have the boys settle Caractacus and Berger at once. We'll ride together this afternoon. From now on, we'll always ride together, Betsy. Always, Father. Always and always. And so the clouds of sorrow began to be dispersed. Even as our own thunder clouds are scattering now over the Blue Ridge. I do believe it is clearing up. You've been most kind, Mr. Burgess. Well, this house has ever borne a reputation for hospitality, ma'am. Now, let us by all means go outside. A sunset at Monticello after a summer storm. Now, that's a spectacle not to be missed. Oh, Mr. Jones. Coming, sir. I was just looking at that big chair over there. It seems rather modern. Well, the, the leather upholstery has been... Uh, Restored, uh, But the design is another of Mr. Jefferson's little notions. It's the first revolving chair ever made, I believe. A and there's a dumb waiter, too, in the dining room. Strange to me how our visitors are always so interested in these little, uh, 
What was the word you used, Mrs. Jones? Uh, gadgets. Oh, yes. Mr. Jefferson, I believe, would have regarded another of his vention as the mole board plow was more important. My, he must have been a busy man. When in good health, ma'am, he never let the sun rise before him. Now, shall we go out on the terrace now? The storm is quite over. Certainly, sir. There. There you see the reason for Monticello. Is it not magnificent? It's really lovely. Why, it, it's breathtaking, this view. Yes. I sometimes think Mr. Jefferson loved his country so dearly because he could see so much of it from his own doorstep. Over there, sir. I suppose that's the University of Virginia, those, those buildings? Oh, yes, that's another of our host's many inventions. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, he once said, it expects what never was and never will be. Oh, I don't see how he could ever bear to leave this spot. Even his friends, ma'am, accuse him of loving all this too well. But I think I can say he never failed to meet the challenge of events. The pursuit of happiness for him led ever down the path of duty. That path in time led to the presidency, to the new city of Washington, just over yonder horizon. Perhaps you can picture him across the, the great valley there, striding into the Senate chamber to deliver his inaugural address. Let us then, fellow citizens, unite with one heart and one mind. Let us restore to social intercourse that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. And let us reflect that having banished from our land that religious intolerance under which mankind so long bled and suffered, we have yet gained little if we countenance a political intolerance as despotic, as wicked, and capable of as bitter and bloody persecutions. Mr. Mr. Burgess. Eh? Oh, my, my, my. My mind, I'm afraid, was elsewhere. What advice, sir, do you suppose Mr. Jefferson would give his fellow countrymen now, in 1951? The earth, he might say, belongs to the living. Make your own life. And surely, he'd say, draw closer together as brothers in freedom... Close your ranks and move forward without fear. And may that infinite power which rules the destinies of the universe lead your counsels to what is best and give them a favorable issue for your peace and prosperity. <laughs> have been listening to Storm at Monticello with Dennis King as Thomas Jefferson. Other members of the cast were Denise Alexander, Martin Blaine, William Greaves, Ronald Long, Claire Neeson, and Gertrude Warner. The orchestra is conducted by Milton Catums with a special score composed by Alan Shulman. <laughs> This is Ben Grauer inviting you to listen to American Portraits next week when we will again present Dennis King as our star in John Yankee, the story of John Adams. This will be the third of a series of eight dramatic character studies of great Americans produced and directed by D. Engelback and written by George Faulkner. Tonight's script was presented through the Curtis and cooperation of the editors of Cavalcade of America, which is heard regularly on Tuesday nights and which will resume its fall broadcasting season on September 4th. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.